Amen. Welcome to Lifeline Baptist Church Sunday evening Bible study. We've been in John in the 8th chapter about the Feast of Tabernacles. And we covered the section in the 8th chapter where a woman was caught in an act of adultery and they asked Jesus to condemn her. Well, I have, uh, I propose tonight to uh, talk about the Feast of Tabernacles at Shiloh in 1 Samuel and uh, to talk about Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, and what happened at the Feast of Tabernacles at Shiloh. And this has to do with the chief priest Eli and the birth of Samuel, the most significant man of God since Moses in the Old Testament. Samuel was a very important leader of Israel at a, at a, at a time when Israel needed a leader. And the judges, and I think the scripture will back up what I'm fixing to say, the judges were not able to control things or govern things or lead things in a way that benefited the country. And they were, they were for instance, being beaten on the battlefield and they were living in a new land. They'd been nomads. And now they're in a land that's settled land where there are where there's easy living, and instead of having to wander around and set up tents, well, they had houses, and, and they could plant crops, and they could grow grapes and make wine, and uh, they could get happy. And all of that downgraded the religion, and the judges couldn't stop it. And so, really, Samuel is the one that went from the judges to the kings, and the idea of the kings was that the kings had enough power to establish a central government and an army that would not be defeated on the battlefield. That did not mean that the king was supposed to protect the religion except militarily. Well, so in the chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, we've got this time of transition that is starting at, at really the end of the judges period since Samuel was the last. And so this is the Feast of Tabernacles and when I say it's a Feast of Tabernacles that is what I'll call a theological guess because it says it was a feast and it's at a central location and it's probably in response to the command to, uh, for Israel to do three feasts and things had deteriorated apparently to the point that they just boiled it down into one feast and they, had, they were doing it at Shiloh. And so we're going to talk about the family background and the nation of the prophet Samuel and the faithfulness of his parents. We'll talk about Hannah as a person, Samuel's mother, and we'll talk about the house of God at Shiloh. Now, the book of Samuel originally was the ancient title of what we now call 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. This is a modern title, four books of one book, the book of Samuel. The ancient Hebrew book, of the book of Samuel, uh, we know this from what we call the Masoretic text, the Masoretes spent uh, a period of 300 years tracking down what the Bible, the Old Testament, should have been, and they tried to get the text together and organize it right. And we don't have the exact copy of their text, but we do have indications of what it was. And so we know that they call the book of Samuel, the whole, all four books, the book of Samuel. And uh, later... The Septuagint, you see there the Roman numerals LXX, that's 70. And that was called the Septuagint. Septim is the number 70 in, uh, in Greek. 
And uh, they put 70 scholars on it down at Alexandria for the Pharaoh who wanted it in his library and they they translated it and so it got called the, the, the Book of the Seventy or the Septuagint. And it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And any translation that we have of the Old Testament depends partly on the Masoretic text and partly on the Septuagint. We don't have all of any of it really, or didn't have by the time of the translation of the King James. Well, the Hebrew text originally was written without vowels. You all understand that the Hebrew that you see, you uh, read it from left to from right to left. Ours goes from left to right. So you read it backwards and there are no vowels. Well, they've added some vowels and there's a dispute about what, that when you add vowels on words that you're not sure about, will you change some meanings? So all the text is a little bit up in the air, but not much. But it was, uh, by the time the Septuagint was translated, well, they did it with vowels. And oh, it took a lot more space. And uh, with the Hebrew text, you could write it on a scroll and get it in there, but with the with the Greek, well, they were making a book out of it, and it took a lot of a lot of pages. So, the Septuagint is where it was broken into four books, and they called it First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kingdoms. Can y'all tell from my notes? There, A and B is First and Second Kingdoms, which is what we now call First and Second Samuel. And third and fourth kingdoms is what we now call first and second kings. Now, Jerome, in translating the Vulgate in about the fourth century, is the one that changed the words kingdoms to kings on the last two. And it took till 1516, you all see there in Venice, Bromberg's Hebrew Bible. Well, he's the one that changed the word kingdoms to Samuel. So this is an explanation how we got 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, all from what they call the book of Samuel. Now, uh, I'll leave it to you. Does it sound like that Samuel wrote all that? I mean, Samuel died, I think, somewhere in 1st Samuel. So it, it's a, it'd be a stretch to say he wrote the rest of it. Well, the exact years of all this are unknown. And you can read my numbers there, and that even that is just a guess and an estimate. I've always remembered that if you want to remember the times, you put Abraham about 2000 B.C., and you put David about 1000 B.C., and so you can put Samuel a little before that, and you've got the time frame. And so the times of Samuel are the times of judges and seers and prophets and finally kings. And so Samuel is the leader that led from the transition from judges, seers, prophets on into kings. And of course, in the time of the kings, you had the rise also of the prophets and so we have the major prophets and the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Are you all with me now? Question. You don't dare, do you? Okay. So Samuel was judge, seer, and a seer is a person who could see things that nobody else could see. And he could see things in the present out there that are beyond the line of vision and he could see maybe into the future. And a prophet, a lot of people think that a prophet is a guy that can just see into the future. The real definition of a prophet is he who speaks for God. And if God has a message he wants us to hear, it may or may not get into the future. But a lot of times in prophecy, the future is brought out for what purpose? To affect the hearers in the here and now. So is the prophet just a future, a future teller? No. He's a guy trying to straighten out the present. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And in Samuel's case, he was also a maker of the kings. 
and he more or less defined what their job was. And uh, I'll, I'll try to give it to you in a quick nutshell. And that is that Samuel, as the prophet, managed religious affairs for the people. And the king ran the government, and they, weren't, and they were supposed to work together in upholding the covenant of God with Abraham. And so the, the prophet had a job, a function in that, and the king had a function in that, but neither one of them was supposed to overrule the other. And that's the weakness of the whole system, and that's what caused the conflict. So here we are at the first verse and the first chapter of Samuel. Now there was a man named Elkanah, Elkanah, who was from Ramathaim Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim, or Ephraim. He was the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, or Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. And remember that word, Zuth, that's going to help us locate where this is. He had two wives, one named Hannah, or Hannah, and the other one, Penina, or Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Now, these are guesses about their names from the translators. Elkanah meant God has taken possession. And what that means is he had taken possession of my life or my mind or my heart. And he was a Zuphite from the Zuphite clan. So remember that word Zuth. I'm going to show you something. And then Hannah, her name has been translated Grace. And she was much loved by her husband Elkanah, but she had no children. And then Panina's name has been translated Pearl. And she had several children, but she had no love for Hannah. And herein is the problem. And then Ramathaim is translated Twin Peaks, or it's also called Ramah, and that means the height. So this place is in the hills, and it's in the Zuphite area, okay? Well, here is a map of the 12 ter territory of the 12 tribes, and I'm going to give you a kind of a heads up on what we're talking about here. There are some that say that this Ramah down here near Jerusalem, you see Jerusalem right there in the bottom, and you see the hill line, these are the mountains of Israel, the central mountains. And so here's Jerusalem, and then Gibeah, and then Ramah. And then you come on down the mountains to Shiloh. See it? All right, the scripture says that they went up to Shiloh. Does that sound like this is Ramah? Does that look like that's downhill from Shiloh? It's not. I'll answer that real quick. All right, downhill is either this way or this way. And this is the territory of Ephraim, and Ramah is not in it. As you see, it's in the territory of Benjamin. So we're looking for a territory out here. And I think I found it, and I went there, and I'll show you some pictures of it. But I'm giving you a heads up where we're talking about it. By the way, uh, to be exact, what I found is about halfway between Joppa, that's now Tel Aviv, Yafo, Joppa, and, that, and about halfway between there and Shiloh, up in the mountains, is the hill country, and about right in here is the town, where I think it was. Year after year, Elkanah would go up from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. And that's an interesting phrase. There's a lot, of, a lot of phrases to describe God in the Bible. And this one describes him as the Lord of hosts. At Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni 
and Phinehas were priests to the Lord. Now, it doesn't talk about them at this point, but it does bring out that Eli and his two sons are the priests of the Lord. Now, the problem with the time of the judges is that these folks moved out of the desert where life was hard and, they, and life was clean, and they moved into this country where living was easy, and they enjoyed their ease, and the religion went downhill. We'll, we'll talk about that. So Elkanah is a proud Zufite, a man of some wealth. And the reason that I know that is because the man had two wives and theoretically two sets of children and two sets of heirs had a pretty good estate. And also it cost pretty good for a man to travel across the country, uphill, up the mountains, to Shiloh with a whole family. I mean, it's a kind of a tribal trek up there is a major thing and so they worship Yahweh the Lord and so his city and I've told you there's uh, Ramathaim in the hill country and so they go up to Shiloh and I'm going to read you a use of the word Shiloh in the Old Testament that you wouldn't expect but this is Jacob's blessing on his sons and remember, the 12 tribes of Israel are the sons of Jacob that are being blessed. And so when he comes to Judah, this is in Genesis 49, 9. Judah is a lion's wealth. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? In other words, when the lion gets up, you better not be there. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until, y'all see it, big letters? Until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, Jesus, or the Messiah, was expected to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And one of his titles is Shiloh. Y'all got that? Every year they had worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. And this is the time of judges, a dark time in Israel. And you have Eli the priest, and he's old. The priest of the what is called here the temple of the Lord. Does that sound like a tent to you? It's not. And they worship God in an idolatrous land. And that's one reason the religion is going downhill. The idolaters are richer than these Jews. They've been there. They own the farms. And, they, and they, they've got all this wealth. And so the, it rubbed off on the, on the Jews as they lived amongst them. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are corrupted by all this downgrade of the religion. And so when the people bring their, their sacrifices, it says that it, before they can even offer them, they said, put it down, we're going to get what we want first. And so they took their part of the sacrifice for it was even offered. They cheated the people. And then there were these women that worked at the temple, and of course the Canaanites had temples where there was prostitution, and I mean the real thing. Uh, and, and so they got into that, and, and the Bible says a prophet came to them, and, and by the way, that prophet's not named. There were other prophets out there. Um, that's another story. But a prophet came to old Levi and said, your sons are doing these things right here. They're having sex with the women that work at your temple. And, and they're going to pay for this, and you're going to pay for this. And, and so Eli knew that at this time. Well, the Canaanites are what the Jews would call Gentiles, and they're worldly. They're idolaters. 
they're prosperous, and of course they have a negative influence on the Hebrews. And Samuel is born in this to a place of leadership. Do you all see the hand of God at work? Now, who started this? Well, I say Hannah. So here is a view of Shiloh from the west. And if my guess and study is right, they came to Shiloh from the west. And this is what they would have seen when they got where they could see it. And it's up there on that hill, y'all. Y'all with me so far? So they go up to Shiloh yearly. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to present his sacrifice, he would give portions to his wife, Panina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved her even though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, I'm going to tread on a little thin ice here and give my opinion about what that means. And uh, y'all promise not to run me off. I will, I will proceed. I say, and well, I'll get that on the next slide, but this, in the first place, I want you to understand that there was more than one kind of sacrifice, and at this time, in the early part of their religion, they hadn't developed all this formal stuff. David is the one that took the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and put it in a, you know, a tent, really, because Solomon's the one built the temple. But during David and Solomon, they came up with all this ritual and all this uh, system of religion. And that, that system wasn't in effect here. This is a little bit what you might call amateurish stuff. But they had a communion sacrifice, and that is the idea that they brought the sacrifice and dedicated it to God and the priests were supposed to take part of it, God's part and burn it and their part they could eat and so God got his part and they got their part and it was a feast y'all get the idea about the Lord's Supper being a little bit like that I mean we had one today y'all y'all see that that is a communion with God well so this is a communion sacrifice. It is not a burnt offering sacrifice in that the whole offering was burnt. And of course, what was so bad about uh, Eli's sons is that the portion that these folks were supposed to eat in communion with God, they would say, well, we're going to take it away from you. And they had thugs with them that would take it by force from the offerers who were coming up there to give it to God and to eat it with God, and they got the choice pieces. I mean, is that corruption? So you get the difference between a burnt offering now and a communion offering. And so these people are eating and drinking at this ceremony. Y'all get that? So Hannah was given a double portion. And it says that she wouldn't eat it. And this thing is supposed to be a celebration. Oh, they're happy. They're communing with God and they're celebrating the, the coming out of the desert and settling in the land and they're celebrating the harvest. They're celebrating the fact that we've got vineyards and we've got trees that give us olives and dates and other things and we're celebrating, we're happy. And we're drinking wine in the presence of God. But Hannah wouldn't do it. And she's solemn. And the point is that they were all celebrating with joy. And Hannah's there with no joy. Because, verse 6, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival would provoke her and taunt her viciously. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord. What? The house of the Lord. That's not a tent. 
Her rival taunted her until she wept and would not eat. Well, now I'm going to walk out on the thin ice, and I, I really think I'm on pretty solid ground. But a lot of people would say I'm not. But I say that they taught the women that it was their duty to produce a son according to God's covenant. And, of course, the marriage covenant was a covenant that they would produce a son. And a woman that couldn't do that, they said she had sinned. And God was punishing her, and they taught the women that. And so, Panina, can you see that she's saying, God's blessing me, and he doesn't like you because you're barren, you're a sinner. Y'all get that? So they were taught that God was punishing them if they were barren. And it says, the scripture says that Panina provoked and taunted her rival. Uh, what's this about rival wives? Is that the way Jesus said it ought to be? I mean, there's some things about the religion that these people were mistaken about. Do you understand that they, I mean, why did Jesus have to come? Why did Jesus have such a hard time telling them that the Feast of Passover was really about him, not about all this stuff? Well, the reason is because they just didn't understand, and the point is, in the end, they didn't want to understand. They were having too good a time. So Hannah was taunted every time. She went to Shiloh, and why did she go there? To worship. So the house of the Lord is not a tabernacle like in the wanderings. They had built a building. And so when she, whenever she tried to worship there were these taunts, and she was weak, weeping, she couldn't celebrate, no joy, she couldn't eat it. Well, here is a picture of something they have constructed at Shiloh in the present day that they think represents what that looked like. I'll just take a moment here and zoom in on it and let you see. And that's what they think it was like. Somebody, somebody thinks it was like that anyway. So her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Well, that's an interesting statement. The other wife is saying that you don't have God because you don't have any children, and your husband has to hate you because you've sinned. And Elkanah is telling her that I don't hate you, and it's okay. I love you anyway. How about that? Well, she was not comforted. And they did not understand her grief. So everyone is eating and drinking and having a good time on this special occasion. It was expensive. It is much trouble to travel up there. Ramaphaim Zophim is 17 miles uphill from Shiloh from people that are what, walking, uh, donkeys, camels? What is it? I don't know. But I know it's 17 miles. Or if you take the road, it's 28 miles. You ever tried to walk 28 miles uphill? I tried it when I was in shape. And it I guarantee you, you're not going to do that in one day. It was a celebration life in their own land instead of that desert out there. And it's fellowship with God. And it's the early version of the Feast of Tabernacles, in my opinion. The scripture really doesn't say so, okay? Y'all let me loose for having an opinion. So they're eating and drinking, representing the feasting with God. And so Hannah is there in this crowd, and she is alone in the crowd, as a sufferer. Y'all get that? So, the point here is that the, the, whoever wrote this story is sure a master 
storyteller. And I'm able to sit here and know that the point is that there's the old religion that's not such a giddy, joyous thing. It's serious. And Hannah is the only one there that represents the old religion. Well, who was, who'd Samuel turn out to be? He's somebody that had to take the new religion and remind them of the old religion and try to bring them back to it. Do y'all get that? So after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, wait a minute, there's something left out. I've got my slides. All right. Uh, let me go on with this. That's verse 9. That's the right place. So after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Now, that thing right there shows you that they hadn't formalized all this ritual and fought her all about the chief priest. I mean, here's the old man, 90-something years old, and he's sitting, on, sitting in an ordinary chair by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. I mean, does that sound like the ones that wanted to crucify Jesus? No, this is not the same. So the fellowship offering, and, and so they had done that, and they had celebrated. And so Eli the priest is sitting there in the temple of the Lord. And the only time that, that this structure is called the temple of the Lord before the time of the kings and when it was when a shown up temple was put up at Jerusalem, the only time that it's ever mentioned is 1 Samuel 9 right here and in chapter 3, verse 3, and that's it. Jeremiah 26, 9 is a prophecy about the temple in Jerusalem when they were saying, we've got the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and the Babylonians cannot come here and tear it down. And Jeremiah said in 26, 9, Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Well, this is, this is really the biblical evidence that Shiloh got torn down because of their decay of the religion. It's in Jeremiah said it was destroyed, and Jerusalem, don't you guys say that Jerusalem can't be destroyed? Shiloh was, and Jerusalem can be. Do y'all get the connection here? Question? Verse 10, in her bitterness, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears, and she made a vow, a vow, pleading, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. What do we do this morning with the Lord's Supper? That's a remembrance. What is a remembrance? It's like you were there. Take a look at that word. Remember me, not forgetting your maidservant, but giving her a son. Then I will dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall ever come on his head. What does this do about all that I've told you that they believe about the man of the house being the Lord over the women and so forth? What, what about that? That's interesting to me. Well, what is a Nazarite vow? Was that a Nazarite vow? It doesn't say so. All it said is, she said no razor will ever come over his head. Well, that's the old time religion out in the desert where they had Nazarites. They didn't have them in this time. Now, Samson 
was a Nazarite, so I'm going to go to Samson. He was to have, he was to drink no wine, he was to eat no grapes, have nothing to do with any of that, no razor, to cut his hair, and no contact with dead bodies or any unclean thing. Well, you're talking about the old religion, the cleanliness of the desert. I'll guarantee you, if something dies in the desert, it won't pollute the desert. It won't be there long. That's the old way. And it's life dedicated to a mission from God. And so her, proud, her prayer or her vow, what is that? Request that God would give her a son. And I'll point out to you that all the covenant terms every time, you just look at the whole Bible and you get this message right here. Do you see that I have, if you, then I, that's the deal that God made to these people. That's the deal, more or less, that Hannah made with God. And you're going to find that that's the deal that the prophets made later on. If you, in the case of the prophets, if you straighten up, then God will bless you. If you don't straighten up, you'll be sorry. So, the vow was to dedicate him to the Lord all his life. And this is her firstborn son. Now, the old way among those people, and they learned this by, the, remember the firstborn in the Passover in Egypt? The firstborn are the ones that were preserved. And so they had a thing about dedicating the firstborn to God. That's why the firstborn really was the heir of everything. And so she has taken her firstborn and given him to God if she had one. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart. Well, y'all not surprised for that, are you? Well, I'll go on and tell you something. She was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. All right, here it is. The people are fat feasting and drinking and celebrating. Y'all see the, the knots that I've got there? Hannah was not. The people pray aloud. You know, Jesus talked about the Pharisees that stood on the street corner and prayed for attention. Y'all ever been in a church? We got churches right here in Little Rock where when they call for prayer, everybody in the whole building prays at one time. Y'all ever been in one of those? It's an interesting experience for a Southern Baptist. I mean, we, we just don't do that. Well, that's how they did that. They all prayed aloud. Even shouting. And Eli, the priest, couldn't hear what she was saying, or he could, no, he, could, he, could, he could tell she wasn't talking. So he thought she was celebrating, and she was not. And he accused her of sin, drunkenness. And not only that, drunkenness when she's supposed to be communing with God. And Hannah was not. Well, a drunken celebration is not worship. He said, he was right about this. Put away your wine. Well, Hannah was not guilty of that. Well, the priest was guilty of something. He had no empathy. He had no spiritual view with her troubles. There's nothing redemptive about what he said. He didn't redeem her. You know, when they brought that woman at the Feast of Tabernacles to Jesus and said, we've caught her in adultery. Did Jesus redeem her? Or did he condemn her? I leave it to you what he did. Y'all know the story. Well, Eli wanted to condemn her. Well, that means, in my opinion, that that's what the prophet was talking about when he accused him of being inadequate. Psalm 3, 4. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. That's how they prayed, to call out. 
Psalm 64, 1. Hear me, my God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. All right, they cried out. They voiced their complaint, and Hannah said nothing. Do you all get it? So the man said, well, now this woman's drunk. Well, she was doing it again. The old, this is the old-time religion. It's not the new religion. So Hosea 4.10 condemned some of this. He said, they will eat but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution but not flourish because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution, old wine, and new wine take away their understanding. So Hannah answers him. No, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman oppressed in spirit. I have not had any wine or strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Well, <laughs> you see, they were pouring out that wine as an offering to God part of it and she said I didn't pour out my wine I poured out my soul that's the old religion I ought to be in the new one do not take your servant for a wicked woman for all this time I have been praying out of the depth of my anguish and grief so now Eli wakes up go in peace and may the God of Israel grant the petition you have asked of him. Well, there are teachers, Sunday school teachers, in my opinion, that will teach that because Eli pronounced a ble priestly blessing on her, that, that, it, was, that it came true. Well, I, I beg to argue with that. Because Eli did not demonstrate faith here. Who did? Hannah. So who had the faith, the priest or the woman? I ask you the question. That's a good question. Well, Hannah had faith, and she had the integrity to go with it. And she could defend herself with the truth. And she was not violent, silenced or cowed down by the chief priest making an accusation against her. And she defended not only herself, but her faith, which is the old faith. She's not cowed by false criticism. She's not had any wine, not any strong drink, and she's not a wicked woman, and she's also not praying for Eli to hear her. You know, how many prayers do we pray? You know, there used to be a dome in the sanctuary of the church in Arkadelphia when I was in Washita. And we'd listen to some of those student preachers pray, and we got to calling that thing the prayer catcher. That that's how far some of those prayers got. When you pray, you need to be talking to God, not to the wind. That's me talking. She wasn't praying for Eli to hear. Out of the depth of anguish and grief, she's praying quietly to God, not Eli. So all this time, it says up there, all this time I have been praying out of the depth of my anguish. Well, Eli had been watching her all this time, and he hadn't caught on. So Eli recovers, and so he tells her, he uses the word peace, shalom, and that's, um, that is a meaning of the word Shiloh. You remember that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. That's Shiloh. That's really what this place is supposed to represent. It. They turned it into something else. So he said, Peace. May the God of Israel grant your petition. Now I pointed out to you, in my opinion, that Hannah is the one who had saving faith and not Eli. And so Eli's blessing did not make Hannah's vow come true Eli's blessing did not redeem Hannah. It redeemed Eli. Do y'all get that? Right, that's, that's me talking. That's not in the Bible that way, but that's how I interpret it. I don't dare ask you if you've got a question. 
It's me this time. <laughs> so, verse 18. May your maidservant find favor with you, said Hannah. Then she went on her way and she began eating again and her face was no longer downcast. Why was it no longer downcast? She had faith that God heard her. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to bow and worship before the Lord. And you find in the Feast of Tabernacles in John that Jesus was at the temple at daylight. There's something about this. Old people just, when the sun came up, they were up and going. So they got up early to bow and worship before the Lord and then returned home to Ramah, or the hill. And Elkanah had relations with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel. The name, when you see an L on a name, uh, this El Canah and Hannah is the name Yah, Yahweh. This L on the name is Elohim. And this is two ideas about God. And so El Canah and Hannah have got Yah on their name, but Samuel's got El on his name. I'll not spend any time explaining the difference. I'm just telling you it's all one God. Because she said, I named him Samuel because I have asked for him from the Lord. And uh, a translation of that means heard of God. You see it down the last note I've got on the page? Mm -hmm. So she's eating again. She believed in God. Faith. Trust. And so they return home. And at home with God, every day is a new day. That's salvation. Every day is a new day with those who are saved. Every day is a day of salvation to those that have been saved. So a son, a blessing of God on the home. Well, do you see that word rantis there? It's pronounced rantis. And do you see the word, the sign there, new zoof? You remember the man's a zoophyte? All right. That young fellow there is a missionary at, uh, at Jerusalem's son that went with me on this day. And there wasn't anybody interested in this but good old me. And that young man decided, well, he's interested too. So we went out together and we found this place. And the sign was messed up and he had to hold it for me so I could take a picture. Now, why Arantis? Well, Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea in the 4th century, who was the first church historian and an advisor to Constantine and who compiled a library that had the first atlas of biblical Palestine in it and who inherited Origen's library. And Origen is the first man who gathered a library with the New Testament writings in it. And so Eusebius was the possessor of those writings and a historian and an advisor to the emperor. And he said that this town, Rantis, was the biblical Ramathaim Zophim, and it was also the New Testament Arimathea. And Jerome, also known as Hieronymus, who lived in Jerusalem, during the time that he was translating the, the uh, Vulgate, the Catholic, what's now the Catholic Bible, and this, uh, this is from 382 to 405 that he translated that, he also said that this town was the birthplace of Samuel, and he also said that it was the home of Joseph of Arimathea. And I know that the man was, that Jerome was one of the original ascetics who lived by himself and so forth. He lived in the desert for 38 years of his life and 34 of it near Bethlehem while he was doing this translating. He would go to the church where that marks the spot where Jesus was supposed to have been born and he would work and then he would go back to, to his 
place out the desert somewhere. He was an ascetic. Well, anyway, these folks are my authority for finding this town. And so here's the view on the highway toward the town. And y'all see all that barren country out there? Well, they may not have been barren like that in the time of them. The Turks, when they possessed the land, they put a tax on all trees. Guess what happened to the trees? Who wants to pay taxes on a tree? Well, it's also a, a battlefield. And here's a picture I made of the, of the remains on the battlefield. And uh, there's the proof that I was there, right there. And uh, that weapon that I've got in my hand right there is an anti-tank weapon. And that young missionary boy <laughs> wanted that, so I gave it to him. And I ran into him when I was on a mission trip down to, uh, was it Guatemala? No, it was uh, Nicaragua. And I ran into him down there, and he still had that thing. But anyway, there's the battlefield. And this is some of the battlefield where the Ark of God was taken and captured by the Philistines. This is a strategic place, and there's a Turkish cavalry fort there that's now abandoned. And I, I made sure to get a picture of that. Here's the ancient Roman road going right through the town. I got, I got a picture of that. And he, here's the high hills. Ranthus is in the hills. And uh, Ramah means in the hills. And this is downhill from Shiloh, like I showed you. And uh, Ramathaim Zophim means twin hills, and that may be it right there. Uh, this is the ruins of the town, of the ancient uh, spot. You know, the uh, times change, and they, and they just leave ruins, and so that's the ruins. And this is a view toward the sea and Tel Aviv. Joppa is down there 15 miles. I'll show you another picture. I, my camera didn't have the right lens on it to get a proper picture. But this is an ancient rock quarry that's there. And that helped convince me that this was an ancient place. And it was, where they, it was the place where they said it was. That's the site right there. And there's a town there. There's the town, and, and that word Ramah also means high place, and high place means place of worship, and that's the mosque. Well, that may not be the picture that's got it. Maybe that right, if, right that's it, right up there. So the next feast, next year, Hannah stays home from the feast. Verse 21, then Elkanah and all his house went up to make the annual sacrifice to the Lord to fulfill his vow, his vow. But Hannah did not go. She had a different vow. Do y'all get that? Did y'all find that unusual? I do. After the boy is weaned, she said to her husband, I will take him to appear before the Lord and stay there permanently. Do what you think is best. Does that sound like that man was trying to be the Lord over her? This is different. Do what you think is best, her husband Elkanah replied, and stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. Well, he's more or less saying, if you're right, the Lord will confirm it. So she stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now we have information about what they thought was weaning time and a child who was weaned you may think he got off the bottle or, or off the breast but what it means is that the child could walk and he could talk and he could comprehend things that's weaned so once she had weaned him Hannah took the boy with her with her didn't say them with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And though the boy was still young, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Please, my Lord, said Hanak, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. Oh, I bet he remembered that. 
there's not many women that rebuked the chief priests of Israel and he knew it I prayed for this boy and since the Lord has granted me what I asked of him I now dedicate the boy to the Lord does he say we dedicate how about that I now dedicate the boy to the Lord for as long as he lives he is dedicated to the Lord so they worship the Lord there so Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life every year he would go on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah judging Israel in all these places and then he would return to Ramah because his home was there and there he judged Israel and built an altar to the Lord. I covered Hannah, and I've got plenty more in here about all this, but I'm, I'm going to be teaching in the New Testament next week again in John at the Feast of Tabernacles, and I do hope that you've had some understanding about the progress of the religion as it developed and the Feast of Tabernacles, and this, I hope this helps explain a little bit what Jesus had to say and why the Jews were arguing with him at their Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' time. Any questions that you have? May we pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time you give us to study your word. Give us insight and depth to the truth of your word. Thrust out laborers for this harvest in this church. Help us to find teachers that will teach the Bible to the younger people in this church. And help us to be a lighthouse on this corner. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.